So, uh, so this afternoon, uh, second speaker will be Leila Schneps, and she will talk about the Golden Dictation Miller Group. Please begin. So um, this, is, this is a very special conference in general. It also seems to be in a very beautiful place, which I just got for now. And I'm very, I'm very grateful to the organizers for doing this. The subject of this conference is unusually uh, coherent and, and uh, just the description of a, a complete theory, in fact. So my talk is going to follow very much directly on everything we heard this morning. And I will be uh, mentioning many of the things that we already heard and, and referring back to them. Uh, but I will... What I'm going to do now is I'm going to take one step farther in the development of Gotendik, of, of what we now call Gotendik Teichmuller theory, which he called Gawa Teichmuller theory. And there, there were many different aspects to the theory, and one a whole uh, and extremely beautiful and I think fertile aspect is the aspect of what we, we call dimension one, meaning the dimension of the moduli space is one. So it's all to do with P1 minus three points, and des saints d'enfants and the action of the Gawa group on, on these objects. And if I were going to express Gottenich Teichmuller theory, the whole theory in just, in just a, a sentence, I would say that what Gottenich wanted to do, so the goal of the theory is to study the absolute Gawa group and to give a completely new description of the absolute Gawa group. And the way to study it is to have it act on geometric objects instead of looking at it acting on on algebraic numbers and studying number fields and ramification in number fields and all the, the very typical number theoretic uh, panoply that number theorists work on. He said, let's have it act on, on fundamental groups, geometric fundamental groups, which are profiling completions of the topological fundamental groups. And so this, this is a very beautiful idea, very natural, because he says, but the Gawa group is automorphisms of these groups, and these are groups with generators and relations, and this gives uh, information on the Gawa group. And this idea, which is, was mentioned in the Eskistan program, led him led in two different directions. Maybe I could even say several directions, but one direction is, yes, if you take all varieties defined over Q, all of them have a pi one, a, a geometric pi one, and they all carry a Gawa action, and they form a big category with all the, the morphisms between the varieties. It forms a big category, or what Gotti actually calls it a tower. And the Gawa group acts on this whole thing with, uh, with respecting all of the structures and the morphisms and everything. But instead of looking at the Gawa group, you can also say, this is a very Gotti style idea. Just take that collection of all the varieties and all the Q morphisms between them, everything defined over Q, and take the automorphism group of that whole structure. So a whole chain of automorphisms acting on every pi one and all respecting all the morphisms. Is that the, the absolute Galois group? So this was one of the, the questions really that was raised by his quote to detect theory. And this, I think, will be the subject of the talk by Florian Popp, who who um, did a very beautiful work with Oda and Matsumoto on, on this question and proved that in fact, that is the absolute Gawa group. The, the trouble with it is that there are so many varieties and it's so vast in general that you don't actually get a good description. You get like a geometric characterization of the absolute Gawa group this way, but you don't get a description of any elements or of the structure of the group. And then, so what Gautendik thought is from this idea, could we reduce that category of varieties to something much smaller so that we can really handle the groups and describe the groups by generators and relations and, and, and really describe that automorphism group of the whole tower? So let's take a smaller tower, but that we can really describe the automorphism groups and ask if that is equal to the Galois group. And he started with P1 minus three points. So the first thing he took was P1 minus three points and the Galois action on that by one, which we were just looking at. And then he said, oh, let's generalize this to, but some, some small collection of varieties, not all varieties over Q. And well, I think maybe most people would have generalized it to P1, P1 minus many points. He actually thought of it as the moduli space, the moduli space of spheres with four marked points. And he generalized it to moduli spaces of Riemann surfaces with marked points. And he created, he took only these, the and he created the tower of these 
And he said, these are wonderful because we can calculate the automorphism group of this tower. And he, this is where the Gotha de Teichmuller group arises from and the two level principle. And that is basically the subject of uh, what I'm going to show you now. The, the theory branched in various different directions. So right now, the direction I want to follow, which is very much the direction that we heard this morning, is the direction of studying the absolute Galois group by looking at action on fundamental groups of certain varieties, but these varieties are going to be the moduli spaces. And I'll talk about the moduli spaces in every, uh, every gen genus and with any number of mark points. Um, how, how do I move to the next page? Oh, did this button? Ah, oh, got it, thank you. Okay, great. Well, I, I'm going to do the same thing as, as Hiroaki in the previous talk, and just a couple of little portions of, from what was in the Eskistan program translated into English. So pi zero three is the pi one of P one minus three points of so G to zero with three mark points. So always we have this notation of G and G is the genus and N is the number of mark points. So aut X is what we would now call out, out, out. So we saw earlier that gamma, which is his notation for Galois Q bar over Q, acts as outer automorphisms of the pi one of P one minus three points. And he said, I think we saw the sentence in Hiroaki's talk, he says, it would be wonderful to have necessary and sufficient conditions on such an automorphism to know whether it comes from the Galois group. Perhaps a conjectural characterization as a subgroup is yet out of reach. I do not yet have any conjecture to propose, but as you can see, there's a little footnote there. And when you go and look at the footnote, the footnote says, nobody should ever say out of reach because you know, the Mordell conjecture was once out of reach, Fermat's last theorem was once out of reach, and then they were in reach. And, and now I do have a conjecture to propose, but he doesn't say what it was, so we will never know. But we have an idea, which I will say later in the talk of perhaps what it might have been that he observed. On the other hand, another task is immediately accessible, which is to describe the action of gamma on all of the type of tower in terms of its action on the first level of pi zero three, meaning to express an automorphism of this tower in terms of the parameter in pi zero three, which picks out the element gamma running through gamma. So all the notation is different from what we had before. The double gamma is going to be GQ or gamma Q bar over Q and the little gamma we could, we're calling it sigma earlier. It's just an element. And what we saw earlier was that to every sigma in the Gawa group was associated a pair lambda, uh, which was chi, which was um, in Z hat star, and an F, which was in the profile completion of, F, of pi one of P one minus three points, which here he's calling pi zero three. And this F, this is what he calls the parameter. So to every sigma, you associate an F, which is an element of the free group of two generators. And the, the problem he's giving here is the problem that I'm going to completely resolve in this talk, is to describe the action of the group on all of the type of the tower with just this one element F that lives in the free group on two generators. So I'm going to go into a little bit of the topology and geometry of the moduli spaces. So first I will just uh, recall a little bit about gray groups and then I'll recall uh, something about the pi ones of moduli spaces, because what makes the whole Teichmuller tower so interesting is that we know these, these groups very well. We have them by generators and relations with special morphisms between them. And uh, so we can, we can do very uh, explicit things with them. So I'm gonna just recall the definition of the gray groups and then relate them to the pi one of genus zero moduli spaces. So gray groups a priori are simply groups made of strings hanging from the ceiling, which you can cross. The generators are just the crossing of two adjacent strands like in the picture. And the only relations in the art and gray group is the one written there. If two crossings are adjacent, oh gosh, I'm so sorry. There you go. Much better, now there's a picture. So if you have a crossing like this of I, I plus one, and then the crossing of I plus one, I plus two, those two elements satisfy the famous braid relation, which is written um, there. And then if you have two crossings that are far from each other that don't touch, they just commute. It doesn't matter which one you do first. So these are very um, natural relations that you can see right away that they're true for braids. And the, the nice thing is to show that there are no further relations for the art and braid groups. However, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the moduli spaces of Riemann surfaces. 
And I'm going to start with the moduli spaces of Riemann surfaces in genus zero, so, which just means you take the Riemann sphere and you put n mark points on it. And you take isomorphism classes of these. That what we saw earlier was that the isomorphisms, the automorphisms are PSL2 of C, and that it's triply transitive. So it's, you have an N mark points, but you can always find an element of PSL2 of C that will take like the first three of them to zero, one infinity. So actually the dimension of this moduli space of genus zero with N mark points is N minus three. So you fix those first three points and then you have N minus three other points. And the, the pi one of that moduli space is a, basically a braid group, which I will explain in a minute exactly why, but I'm gonna tell you which braid group first. It's actually a quotient of the braid group we just saw. And you have to quotient by the two relations that are here. If you have a, a one strand goes all the way around, that's, quotient, that's equal to one. And then when you take the whole braid and you just twist the whole thing like a ribbon around completely, that one is also equal to one. So essentially, thank you, gosh, I, <laughs> I keep forgetting. Essentially, I want to explain the reason for this. Um, what, so what is the pi one of the moduli space? What is the path on the pi one? It, you start at a point and you wander around the moduli space and then you end up at the same point where you started. So the point you started at is a point on the moduli space of what I'm going to say is not just true for genus zero. I'm just going to talk in general for the moduli space of Riemann surfaces of genus G with N mark points. So you pick a point on the moduli space. It means you pick a Riemann surface with N mark points. And now you have a path on the moduli space, which means that continuously you're changing your complex structure and your mark points, but in a continuous way. So in genus zero, you're not even changing your complex structure because there's only one complex structure on P1. So all you're changing in genus zero is the mark points. Uh, whereas if you're in genus G, you, you can, we saw earlier with the Fenchel Nielsen coordinates that you can choose a, a set of disjoint loops and you can twist these loops and you can make them the, gen, the geodesics longer and shorter. So in genus G, uh, to describe a path uh, as a modification of the complex structure of the mark, mark point is a little bit more complicated, but it's the same idea. That you're just uh, continuously deforming the structure. In, along, uh, on genus zero, you're simply moving the points. And so now if you visualize it, you start with your sphere and your, and your mark points and you move them. But if you like, if you move outwards with time, so that like you move down with time, the points are all moving around the sphere, but they can never collide. The, the, the end points on your sphere have to be disjoint. You, you can't have, at, at infinity, if you compactify, you can have some collision, but you cannot have them in the actual moduli space. So while all of your, your points are moving around, they are never colliding. And so they're always moving behind or in front of each other. And basically, if you let their movements be parametrized through time, what you have is just a braid. That's really all it is. And you can also see that some movements of points are actually going to end up being trivial because like the first one that I said earlier, the, the one on the left there, if a point goes all the way around the others and you're on a sphere, it, you can just, it, it can, you can see it's making an empty loop at the back of the sphere. So you have your points in a row and this point just, it goes all the way around all the others and goes back and you just, around the back of the sphere, it's just trivial. It, so it's the same, this is the reason that we have to work in this quotient group of the braid uh, group is simply because we want to, what we really want to study is something geometric, which is the pi one of the moduli space. Okay, so let me just quickly talk about two kinds of moduli spaces. There's the moduli spaces where you have n mark points in order, and then there's a the moduli space where you have n mark points given as a set, but without any special order. So, which is a quotient of the first one by the axle of the permutation group. So the pi one, that I was just describing, which is the Bray group, but I didn't say anything about the, the strands can, they can start in one place and end up in a different place. That is the pi one of the unordered moduli space. If you want to look at the pi one of the ordered moduli space, then each one of your braid strands, each braid strand represents the motion of a point around the, the sphere. It has to end up at the same place where it started. Those braids are called pure braids. And they're, they're generated by the, 
They're generated by all the braids that look like this XIJ. So in the previous talk, uh, Hiroaki mentioned these XIJs as generators and he didn't really give the, the definition of them or the structure of the braid group, but I'm catching up on that by giving it here. The pure braid group is a subgroup of the braid group. So the braid group has those simple relations that I gave at the beginning. So this one, the relations are slightly more complicated, but okay, they're not so bad. Again, the two of these braids commute if they're distant from each other. And otherwise you have that one very nice relation. It's, this is not the usual presentation given of the, uh, the presentation I gave here is the five strand braid group only. It's more, there are more things for the higher braid groups, but this is the one we'll be using really for, for the definition. So I give this one. And I like this form of relation for this spray group because it, it is very much reflected in the construction of the group, the Gotha Dictatibular group. So the Gotha Dictatibular group is going to be acting on the profinite completions of these groups because these are pi ones of things that are defined over Q. So, it, the, so the Galois group acts. And what we're doing is the whole point of this Gotha Dictatibular theory is to approximate the Galois group by looking at the biggest group that acts on all these objects. So when, I'm, when you're talking about constructing the Teichmuller tower and respecting the, the, the automorphism group that respects all the structures, you have to say who the objects of your tower are and who the morphisms of your tower are. And what Gotendik said in a very nice passage of the Eskis, which I didn't, uh, which I didn't quote here, is, not take every possible morphism between, between these spaces that exist, but simply he wanted to take the Lego, what he called the Lego. So he talked about this Lego game that everybody plays with where you take two pieces and you stick them together, which we saw also in the earlier talk with, he said the smallest pieces are what you call trinions, which usually I call pants. They look like pairs of pants. Um, they're pieces and then you stick them together along a geodesic of equal length and you create this way a complex structure. So, he didn't, he, he equipped the Teichmuller tower with two kinds of topological morphisms. What he says is, like the theory of dessin d'enfant, where we try to understand the Galois group by its action on dessins, which are these little topological drawings, I, here's the same. We want to understand the Galois group by looking at objects which are fundamentally topological. I, because the pi one, it's really just the pi one of the moduli space of, I mean, it's a topological pi one. I mean, it's the profile of completion, but fundamentally it's telling you the shape of the, the pi of the, of the moduli space. And the morphisms he wanted between them, they're not any possible morphisms. He wanted morphisms that come from topology. And so, okay. We heard a lot about uh, pants decompositions and simple closed loops earlier. So let me say something very important about, in order to understand how the, the automorphism group of the Teichmuller tower will work, we have to understand the generators and relations of the, type, of the groups in the Teichmuller tower, which are the fundamental groups of moduli spaces. But in order to understand those groups, what's really good to do, exactly like I just said for the genus zero case, where I explained why braid groups were just the points moving on the surface, um, that's true for every pi one of every moduli space. The pi ones of the moduli space are, it, what I said before is basically you start at some Riemann surface of type genus G with n mark points and you, you change the, the complex structure in a one parameter continuous well. To say it, to say it with specific generators, um, you, can, you have a set of, let me go to this one. Well, okay. So basically the elements of the pi one are, are diffeomorphisms up to isotopes. And I wrote it for genus zero, but it's true for all genera. So the things that are written here, which are just what I was just talking about are very similar things are going to be true in all genera, but we're going to use a set of uh, generators and relations, a particular system of genera generators and relations that will, be, uh, that will be completely general. Before doing that, I'll stay in genus zero just for a little while longer. 
and describe what the genus zero space looks like. We're, and at a certain point, we're going to, the reason I want to do this is because we're going to have certain morphisms between the pi ones that are going to be part of the Teichmutter tower that the Galois action has to respect. And these morphisms aren't just any morphisms, they come from specific morphisms between the moduli spaces. So they're morphisms between the pi ones, but they come from morphisms between the moduli spaces. But even those aren't just any morphisms, they come from actions that you do on the topological surfaces of type GN. So I, this is what I want to get to. And everything I'm going to say in genus zero is pretty much going to be true in genus G2, but genus zero is just something that you can express things in very nicely. So genus zero moduli spaces are particularly simple in their structure because you just, like I said, they're of dimension n minus three. You just give n minus three eight points and then zero, one infinity, and then you just remove all the lines where two points collide. So the, 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 moduli space, the moduli space itself has a simple structure and the pi one looks like a braid group as we just saw. So certain things are nice and simple in the genus zero case. This we already saw earlier, but N04 is, is itself just P1 minus three points because the fourth point can be anywhere in P1 except zero, one and infinity. So, and this is kind of the key departure point of Gotendieck when he saw P1 minus three points, which is the first hyperbolic curve and which is the, the only curve having certain properties and it was really a starting point. And it, it was this Gotendieck like idea when he wanted to generalize it, to generalize it to all moduli spaces. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's actually minus seven lines. It's minus X equals Y and minus X equals zero, one infinity and Y equals zero, one infinity. And I won't unfortunately have time to talk here about the beautiful Delaney Mumford compactification of the moduli space, but I remember very well learning about them from, from Professor Ihara, who uh, really introduced me into this whole beautiful subject. And I, and he, I remember him saying N05 is P1 squared minus seven lines, but the compactification, you add back 10 lines, which is uh, one of the most graphic ways I've ever seen to understand exactly what's happening with the Delaney Mumford. But I, I, it's very relevant to what I'm describing now, but I don't have time to, to, to describe it in detail, unfortunately. Okay, for every number of mark points, we always have two moduli spaces, the ordered one and a quotient of it, which is the unordered one. So the pi one of the ordered one is a subgroup of the pi one of the unordered one, and, and in, we mainly we'll consider the ordered ones. Okay, so there are some very special points on moduli spaces. Moduli spaces are not always schemes. They're not always, they have, they, they can be, topologically speaking, they can be orbifold. So normally, if you have a variety, you have a, a universal cover and you have a, a, the, a group that's acting on it transitively, freely, and, and you have the quotient. But it can also happen that the group isn't acting freely. And you can still have, everything works exactly the same, and you still have a quotient, and it still can be defined over Q, and you can still have a Gal action on this group. But there will be some fixed points of some some fixed points under some action of some subgroup of the group. And what happens in the case of moduli spaces is you can have a finite group that actually fixes a point. And this is going to happen exactly when you have an algebraic curve, which has an automorphism. So it's like the pi one of the moduli space is acting on the universal cover, which is Teichmuller space, but it's not acting freely. There are some points that are preserved by some finite subgroups, and these points will map down on moduli space to the cur algebraic curves with automorphism. So you have some very nice special points there. I gave a couple of examples here. So if you have P1 minus the n of unity, then an n rotation is going to fix that as, as an element of the unordered. So it turns out that the M0 n ordered are actually schemes, but the unordered ones are are not, they're stacks or orbifolds. It makes no difference. It doesn't make any difference. You still have the, the, the groups and the gal action on the groups and everything works the same. Oh, so here is where I gave a couple of examples. I really have to stop forgetting to turn that, okay. Um, here I just gave a couple of examples to show that you can have some fixed points. But the main remark on the subject of the fixed points is that, okay, I'll tell you a secret. My main result that I'm going to use here on the subject of the fixed points is that they make no difference. Every, everything will be just as though they're an ordinary pi one. 
But Gotedik uh, did say, and this is something that we never truly developed a lot, it's a really interesting idea, that instead of using base points on the moduli spaces at infinity, like what we saw earlier with P1 minus three points where he took the tangential base points coming out of the three missing points, Gotedik said you could do a completely different thing and take the special points, the points of special automorphisms as your base points for your groupoid and develop the Gal action on that groupoid and it would be completely different and have a, a rich geometric content. And it looks very interesting, but I don't think anybody's ever done it. So uh, even on P1 minus three points, you wouldn't take those six tangential base points, but you would take one half minus one and two, and then you would take the six roots of unity and it would be different base points and a different groupoid. And it sounds quite like a fun game, but no one's ever actually done it. Okay, but anyway, there are two versions of the Gotenik Teichmiller group. The first version, which comes right out of Drinfeld's work, was just in genus zero. And then there's a further version where everything was extended to genus G. So first I'm just going to talk about the original Gotenik Teichmiller group, which is just in genus zero. So I just need one little piece of notation. If I have, a, if I have a, the free group of two generators, I can, I can write an element of it as f of a, b, and we understand that it's a word and the variables, a, well, let's say x and y are the generators of the free group bunch of generators. And a word in x, y, I can call it f of x, y. But if you have the profinite group, you can't really do that. In a way, it, it does make sense because they're not words. They're, it's an infinite tuple of words. So I'm just giving a meaning to the expression f of x, y which a priori doesn't seem to have a meaning in a profile and completion. So every time I take a, a group morphism from my profile and completion of the free group of two generators to any finite group, I map X and Y to two elements A and B, and the notation F of AB is just a notation that's used for the image. So if I take the identity from F2 hat to F2 hat, then I can write F of XY for F. It is just F. F of XY is just F. So it's not to be viewed as a notation in which you can plug something in for X and Y every place. It's, it's just a notation that tells you that you're, you've sent F into this group by, by this morphism. So Drinfeld is the one who actually defined this group and wrote down these generators. Gotendieck is not the one who did this. Gotendieck indicated vaguely that this could be done and he didn't do it and he didn't do it in the sketch of a program I don't know if he he did it maybe in his private papers or something I'm not sure but there's no doubt that he had these properties in mind when you when you've learned it, these properties and seen where they come from and studied them and then you go back and read the sketch of a program you you do understand that Gotendieck knew that such properties like this is what was going to come out of studying the the, um, the action of a group on, on the moduli spaces. So this is the group. So again, F of something, something just means the image of it. So F of XY is just F. And F of YX is what happens to F under the morphism of F2 that exchanges X and Y. So the first relation is a very simple relation that says that these two have to be inverses of each other. The second relation, uh, it's often very nice to take lambda equals one, which in Galois terms, according to the, what we saw previously, when, when these elements are, come from Galois group, the lambda is just the cyclotomic character chi of sigma. And the f is a certain f sigma that we saw acting on the straight path from zero to one. So when you take lambda equals one, in, in terms of Galois, it corresponds to taking Gal, the, the, the absolute Galois group, group of Q ad instead of Q. And it can be very nice sometimes to take lambda equals one and simplify the formulas. And then you could see that the, the property number two, just because the three cycle, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, uh, respecting the symmetry of the fact that although it's F2 with two generators, it's more natural to see it with three generators whose product is one, which are loops around zero, one, and infinity. So the, the second relation respects the, the, the symmetry of, the, of, of pi one of P1 minus three points. And the third relation, of course, is the really classical pentagon relation. You can't write it in the pi one of P1 minus three points. What you do is you take your element F and you map it into the gamma zero five, which is the pi one of, of the moduli space M05 in five different ways 
And then you, five different ways cyclically, according to, to going around the, the thread, one, two, three, four, five, six, five, one. And then you, you take the product of those five. And that has to equal one. And so what I'm going to do in the next bit of the talk is I'm going to, to explain where, this, where these relations arise from and how they respect the, the, the geometry of the modulus the moduli space that's respected in. I, what, I can't hear. Oh yeah, because in fact, um, what we saw earlier is, yeah, let me just show, the, let me just show the next one. Okay, why F2 prime? Why F2 prime? Because how do you put a multiplication on GT? is you're going to see it as automorphisms. And we already saw exactly all this for GQ in the earlier talks. You start by making it into a morphism of F2. And the morphism is written there, except that F is not well-defined if you write this morphism this way. If you write this, and you can multiply F on the left by a power of Y, and that wouldn't change anything. And you could even multiply it on the right by a power of X. And just, uh, you, you could uh, compose this whole thing by an, in the in inner automorphism by a power of x. And that wouldn't change anything either. And so you, this, this doesn't allow you to pick a, a unique version of, of f. So what you do, what Gotendieck does to fix that is, is to take f in the derived subgroup of f2 hat. And that fixes exactly which power of y you put on the left and which power of x you put on the right. Because the derived subgroup, it's the kernel, it has to be the kernel of the map that maps x to 1 intersect the kernel of the map that maps y to y. And so that fixes exactly the y and the x that you can put on each side of f to, to adjust it. And that gives you a unique one of f. And that's why we actually choose the unique one that sits inside there. So the composition law on GT is very simple because you just compose these automorphisms. Um, something should be very clear, as far as I know, at least, it is not known whether every f in f2 hat actually gives an automorphism this way. I, it seems like it could sometimes be an endomorphism. So when you're defining the group GT, you have to add the condition, this gives an automorphism. And I don't think it's actually known whether that's a real condition or not. So why is that a What? Why is that a Like go to the previous slide. Why is that a Oh, sorry. Why is F in the commutator? It, it's a choice because F is not uniquely defined by this. Well, is not no. If, you, if, if this is an automorphism, there could be many Fs. F is not an automorphism. One has to understand that F is an outer automorphism. It's a, it's a lift. It's a lift of the outer automorphism to this. And the only condition I put on my lift is that X itself has to be raised to this power. So this little F here is not well-defined. What's given to me is the, is the outer automorphism. This little F is not given to me. I have to get little F back from being given this automorphism. And I can't get little F back in a unique way. There are many choices for this little F. I, but if I fix it to be in the commutator, then it, there's a unique choice. So that's just a convenience to, to choose a, a unique one. Yeah, that's a very. And what is true? I mean, you can either take a normalization. Yeah. But the F sigma of this morning was already in a two part, in a two part. Yeah. Because you can check that the sigma has to be really on the compute. It has to be really on the abelian code, on the abelian, uh, on the abelian. Uh, uh -huh. There you go. Since it's after you don't have the abelian code number, which are yeah. very Okay, so the F's of this morning were already in the commutator. So, so this choice for GT is coherent with what comes from, from Gaba. Okay, okay, why, why, proves, how, why are they groups? Why are, oops, back to the next one. Why are they, why are they groups? So we, we saw that we could multiply, which is already good. 
if we chose the Fs of the Derrida automorphism, then we can invert them, which is also good. But the three relations are more of a puzzle. So where do those relations come from? They come from acting on the fundamental groups of, mod of these moduli spaces. Now I'm going to say rather quickly um, where the three relations come from and how you prove that, that it's really a group, simply because it's the automorphism group of, of these Bray groups. And therefore, if you take two automorphisms of a Bray group and you compose them, it's gonna be the automorphism of a Bray group. The, it's the fact of respecting the relations in the Bray group that force the three defining relations of GT. Uh, in a word, this is the proof of why it's a group. So we're going to go inside the whole Bray group B3 because we, can, we won't see the relations one and two appearing if we just look at the free group one, two generators. You won't see any relations appearing. The free group is free, but they'd also act on these bigger fundamental groups. So this is B3, this is the fundamental group of the unordered moduli space of spheres with, with unordered four points. So it's bigger and it has some relations and in particular it has these two relations. Well, this one we saw, but this one it has. This element is central um, or it's equal to one in the, in the quotient break group. So what happens when you, you take this action here and you force it to respect this relation and this relation? You do a computation, which I lied here because I wrote the word easy, but it's actually not that easy. And I won't do it for you. It's a direct computation, but but I will show it to you, just so you know. Um, what this, so there are several things to prove. You have to prove that an automorphism of the Bray group must satisfy that relation, and that the relations mean that the automorphism does satisfy this. That the, the, when I say that relation, I mean relations one, two, and three of GT. One and two, one and two, only one and two come from acting on B3. You have to show that respecting the relations of B3 produce relations one and two, and that respecting relations one and two mean that you really are an, an automorphism of B3. And this is only one part of it, and it's, it all looks like this, but it's not that hard and it's not that complicated. It's just, it's just uh, some work, basically. It only takes a page or two. But the end result is that those two relations, one and two, that define the group called GT0, they make it into an automorphism group of B3. And that's all you really need, because once you know that they're automorphism of B3, you compose them, they're still an automorphism of B3. So they still, uh, they still satisfy those relations. So you multiply, the, you, you can calculate the inverse, you can calculate the product, and above all, you know that if you multiply two automorphisms of this group, it's still an automorphism of this group. So that kind of proves it for, that proves theor 1a. Okay, so now we're going to talk about something that's very important. When you want to approximate the Galois group, you want to find a group that might be the Galois group, but you want to describe your Galois group by some properties, not by what people have done before, like looking for uh, finite quotients and studying inverse Galois theory, and, but just by a geometric approach, looking at its actual and phi ones. Well, the, the, there's a major feature of the Galois group action on fundamental groups, which is that it, pres it preserves inertia groups. So if you have a fundamental group and you look at its automorphism group and you want to approximate or say maybe the, you know maybe it's the it is the gala group it contains the gala group maybe it is the gala group you have to restrict your attention to automorphisms that preserve inertia because this is a major property of, of the gala group so instead of looking at all possible outer automorphism groups of the fundamental groups we're going to look at only the ones that have that that particular gala property and you have to know who the inertia groups are. So in the genus zero case, that's particularly easy because they're the braid, they're the braid generators that I gave you. The braid generators, they are the sigma i if you're looking at the unordered braids and they're the, the xij if you're looking at the ordered braids. So what does it mean that we're only going to look at automorphisms of these groups that preserve those? To preserve it, I mean, they preserve the cyclic group generated by these inertia up to conjugacy. 
meaning you have to raise the initial generators to a power and conjugate them by something. And that's really what we saw already in, in, this, in this action here. You have two inertia generators. This is just one possible lift, but you could lift it other ways. But the main thing is they're both raised to powers and, uh, and conjugated. So the idea is to take the atomorphism group that preserves inertia out star of gamma g n, let's say in g to zero for now, for all g and n, but, or for all zero and n. And now let's look at some properties that it's supposed to respect. Okay, so we, we just finished proving this basically. It's just another way of phrasing what we proved. We made sure that sigma one and sigma two were conjugated and raised to a power. So it's definitely an out star. And so we have this so far. So far, now we're going to move on. Oh, this is just a remark by the way. From the definition of GT acting on profinite groups, it's not completely obvious that it is itself a profinite group. So this is just a short remark that explains that it really is a profinite group, but it isn't like the profinite completion of, of a discrete group. In fact, and Drinfeld asked this question, what if I write down the definition, couples lambda f and relations one, two, and three, but I asked for lambda to be in z and f to be in the discrete f2. And then he calculated you only get plus or minus one. So this is, this is a profinite group, but it's not the profinite completion of, of any discrete group, which is also true for Galois Kubarser. Q bar over Q. But the completion of something which is not defined by its relation. The fact that this group is plus or minus one does not prove uh, that it's uh, not Who knows? If anything can happen. It's definitely not the profinite completion of a discrete group defined by those relations. Could it be the profile and completion of a discrete group? I really don't think so. I don't know. But I don't know. I really don't know. I really don't know. If they exist. <laughs> yeah, except that sometimes you just don't know. Okay, I'm going to skip very rapidly over this part because all I've done in the next part is to do the exact same thing I just did for GT0, but for the third relation, which is the Pentagon. I'm only going to make one. I'm going to brush past the proof quite quickly, but I'm on, it's the very same proof. Just I wrote down the relations in the group gamma zero five. But the really interesting thing is there's only one relation that makes a difference in the end. There are several relations in that group, but they're all automatically satisfied already, except for if this one is satisfied. And this one, oh, sorry. This one is that you have a, this cyclical element here, which is of order five. You have an order five cycle in that group. And so when you, you have your, your couple lambda f acting on it, you have to take the action, take that to the fifth power, and it has to be equal to one. And if you do the whole calculation, which is a bit long and painful, this is where this comes from. It's really just basically this C, it's mapped to C times F. And so when you take it to the fifth power, it's CF, 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 CF. And then you move the five cycle to the left, and it, it shifts all the XIJs by one position. And this is exactly why you get the five cycle relation. And the interesting thing is, once you get the five cycle relation on F, which is relation three, the Pentagon, it just comes from this one element of order five in gamma zero five, all the other relations you need to satisfy in gamma zero five are automatically satisfied. So you don't need to, even though there are many relations in gamma zero five, you don't add to, you don't need to add a bunch of corresponding relations to the definition. You need to add only the five cycle, the others are automatic. Oh yeah, so this is, uh, this is basically what happens. You get relation three from this one relation, 
and then you, you get everything else for free. And in fact, in this theory, it's remarkable because you get a lot of stuff for free. You always have to do a bit less than you thought you had to do. So, okay, this is just the rest of the, it's the same proof as before. You have to prove that the relations one, two, and three give you automorphisms, and that an automorphism must satisfy relations one, two, and three. So I worked it out, but I'm not going to do it because it's a bit complicated. So I'll just skip to the end of that part. And we have the same results as before, pretty much. So GT, what does GT now do? GT satisfy, well, it's, it's a profiling group. It's the automorphism group of gamma zero five. This little theorem at the end here, it says that it, it, is, the, it is the automorphism, outer automorphism group of gamma zero five that commutes with the permutations, which are also in this autom auto automorphism group. So in fact, you don't actually even have to talk about gamma zero four in order to, to, to describe GT. <coughs> but it's nice to if you do. I would like to actually stay in a, in, a, in a situation where I have a tower and several groups and morphisms. So now I'm going to, now I said you get lots of stuff for free. And here's one of the main things you get for free. If you now have the group GT that acts on the gray group B3, and, or the, let's say the pure gray group gamma zero four and the pure gray group gamma zero five, all of a sudden it acts on all the gamma zero n, just because it acts on, on four and five. And this is something that is really very interesting. The first version of the statement was actually noted by Drinfeld. So Drinfeld said, he just took all the gray groups and he, he took the, really, he was the one who defined the, the group GT and called it GT. And he took pairs lambda F that satisfied what we just saw, the three, their, their automorphisms of gamma zero four, gamma zero five. And he wrote down this equation. It's a little bit magical. He was the one who really discovered this. And he said, just writing this down makes those same pairs act on all of the gray groups, which means, of course, they act on all of the fundamental groups of N0N, the modulated basis for all number of, of mark points. And what's happening here? Why did he write down this explicit formula? What does it really mean? Well, it's hard to see what this braid is when you write it down as an equation. But basically what, what happens is you take your action on gamma zero five and you, you double the first strand. You just take the first strand and you make it into two strands that are running parallel and then three strands and then four strands. And then you, you, you have the exact same action. Instead of having sigma one squared here and sigma two squared, the sigma one squared is replaced by this fat braid where the, the first strand has become a bunch of strands and the second strand is still one strand. And then the second one, it's the same as it was before, but it's shifted down by the number of strands that you added. What this is, is essentially the same action as we already have, but with the first strand flat, flattened out into many strands. And it's just a remarkable thing that you only need to act on, on gamma zero four and gamma zero five to then act on all the gamma zero ends. In fact, all the, all the non-pure braids gamma a B n for all n. Okay, so now I can finally reach the Teichmutter Tower. So we get, it gets interesting because the Teichmutter Tower is the set, okay, in the genus zero Teichmutter Tower is the set of all the gamma ends and linked by certain morphisms. And now we've already basically seen as we go along that GT acts on all these gamma ends. And there are some morphisms for which the morphisms between the Bray groups will be respected by this GT action. And the morphism that I just described explicitly is the doubling the first strand. If you, if you double the first strand and then by extension triple or quadruple, you multiply the first strand to make it into many strands. These are the morphisms between the Bray groups that are all respected by, by the Bray group, by, by, the, by the action GT. And everything that I'm saying about GT here, everything that GT does is also done by GQ. So at every point, while I'm telling you the properties of GT, whether it's the relations or the fact that it acts on these fundamental groups or that it respects these morphisms, everything is always true of GQ. So the question always remains legitimate. Are these groups equal? Is this enough to capture? Is it, like what I said at the beginning was, if you have all varieties, you capture GQ. 
the group that acts on all pi ones of all varieties with all morphisms is GQ. Here I have just a very small collection of varieties and a small collection of morphisms and the group that captures all of them. But maybe it's enough to get GQ. And the beautiful thing about this version is that I have those relations that describe it completely explicitly. So the two-level principle of Gotendieck basically consists of what we just saw. If I make sure that I satisfy the relations in the first grade group, B3, and then I make sure that I satisfy the relations in the second grade group with its five cycle, and I get all the other ones in, in gene zero for free. Uh, this is essentially the nature of the two level principle that only the moduli spaces of dimensions one and two are necessary to capture at least the entire group GT. I don't know, we don't know yet if it's true to capture the whole group GQ, but it's definitely enough to capture the whole group GT. It then acts on everything. What did Gordon Dick actually say? No, that really has to be proved. Yeah, but then using this identification is perfectly right. Could you say things like that? Once you've explained that GT is the automorphism group of a structure, yeah. then it that the relations simply are equivalent to its being an automorphism group of a certain group, then yes, it becomes clear that it's a group. Because if you have two automorphisms of a group and you compose them, it stays an automorphism of a group. Okay. So you, what was necessary to prove that I went through rather quickly is that the relations imply that it's an automorphism of the group and that if it's an automorphism of the group, it, it has to have those relations that they're equivalent. So this is directly from the Esquista Programme where he talks about the first two levels. And when you read this, it's, it's really remarkable, especially when you first read it, it seems to make no sense. And then when you've worked on it for a long time and you come back and read it, you, it seems like he understood everything already. So complete knowledge of the first two levels, which is the modular dimension, is to be found in the principle that the entire tower can be reconstituted from the first two levels in the sense that via the fundamental operation of gluing, you get generators and relations. So a topological way to say that is that if you take the trillions that we saw earlier and you glue those pieces together, you construct every surface. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, so I left out a paragraph here where he talks about the meaning of two levels in a different way, which will be, yeah, which will be addressed also. But okay, heavy, I have no doubt about this principle of construction of the technical tower. I prefer to leave to the experts better equipped than I am the task of proving the necessary, if it so happens that any are interested, to study with all the care it deserves the structure which ensued for the technical tower and um, understanding the four modular multiplicities. So you notice that he gives M04 and M05, but also the first two in genus one. So genus zero and one are really key for this situation. So let's, um, let's see what happens a little bit now if we move to higher genus. Okay, so, oh, there's a remark I want to make before moving to higher genus. I'm, and this is a very quick remark, but it's nice. It's very nice. We know that gamma Q of Q bar over Q is in GT. We know it because G, GT is the group of everything, every automorphism with such properties and GQ are automorphisms that have those properties. So it's in there. But we can say specifically why GQ satisfies the three relations. So I'm not gonna explain it, just, I'll just explain the first one really quickly because it's just, it's very easy. The reason that, let's just take the first relation. So f of xy times f of yx equal one, just that relation. Here you have a path going from zero to one half. When it's at zero, it's the tangential base point of zero. Zero to one half, which I call R. Theta is z gives one minus z. It's just the mirror automorphism. Theta of z goes from one to one half. So if you compose the two, R and then theta of R, you get P. And we know how, we know that, we know how, the guy will go back to P. It maps P to P times at F sigma. But it also acts on R because Galois Q bar over Q acts on every path whose endpoints are defined over Q. It acts on R and it's going to send R, it's going to map R to some. It's going to map R to some 
so we have this. R goes from zero to one half, and then P inverse goes from one half to one, uh, R theta of R. So we map R to something. Did I write it? Well, I didn't really write it here, but the idea is you map R to something like R times G, G of X, Y. And then theta of R is mapped to theta of R times G of theta X, theta of Y, but that's just G of Y, X. So when you then say, take R times theta of R, it's multiplied by G of X, Y times G of Y, X. But this is just P maps to PF. So F has this very special form. And because F has that form, then F of XY times F of YX equals one. It's because F itself has like the form of a co-cycle. I didn't write it very well on this page, but essentially it comes, it, the, you can see geometrically right away on, on paths between special points, why it satisfies the three relations, which is not necessary, but a nice way to see. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to end with a couple of remarks on higher genus and a couple of questions. So the remarks on higher genus are what Gottendieck said when he mentioned the moduli spaces of dimension one and two, that turned out to be true. The moduli spaces M11 is very well understood. It's the fundamental domain of elliptic curves. It looks very much like P1 minus three points mod S3. And so we know we have the GT action on it already. But M12 is a bit more complicated. And when, when we try to see whether GT acts on the pi one of M12, we could not prove this. There is a relation that's important in M12, which a priori doesn't, we couldn't figure out, it, it's just not known. I mean, maybe in some complicated way, GT does respect that relation, but we couldn't see it. In order to make GT act on that relation, we had to add a new relation to GT, a fourth relation, very nice one. So we added a new relation to GT, one more, a fourth one. And that group, again, immediately obeyed the two level principle and acted on all of the gamma GNs for all genus and all number of bar points. So the two level principle of Gotendieck was, was respected. And the, the definition that we have for null genera has four relations, one for each of the four moduli spaces. So it's just not known how independent these relations are from each other and how necessary they are. But it's a very nice symmetric picture with this group with four relations acting just on the first four fundamental groups of the first moduli space, but then, then extends to all of the moduli spaces. But then you can ask, you know, now we reach the, now we reach the crux of the matter, which is we have this group that acts on all the pi ones of moduli spaces that, that satisfies lots of beautiful um, morphisms, which I didn't really describe, topological ones that go to dequanted, which come from erasing mark points or gluing the trinions together, uh, taking two, two subsurfaces and gluing them together. All of those topological activities give morphisms between moduli spaces, which give morphisms between their fundamental groups, which are respected by this GT action. So in those terms, it really looks a lot like GQ and it definitely contains GQ. But what if it's bigger? This is the crux of the matter. This is where the theory reaches a wall because we don't know. So uh, many people, including uh, starting with Ihara, asked some smaller questions. Instead of saying, you know, is GT equal to GQ? They said, is this property of TQ, hold, does, does this property of TQ hold? And the first question that Ihara asked us many, many years ago was this, is that's a complex conjugation element. So the, the element where lambda equals minus one and F is one is complex conjugation. And it's self-centralizing in GQ and he asked if it's self-centralizing in GT. <coughs> This is one very major and very useful property of GT. And we, so we were able to prove that this is true also in GT. And this has a very, very strong consequence. It shows in fact that you can deduce from this that if GQ is normal as a subgroup of GT, then it is equal to GT. And it seems really difficult to imagine how it could like not be a normal subgroup because what would its conjugates even be? But again, this, is, this is, seems like a very good heuristic reasoning, but it stops there, we don't know how to prove it. So I just have a couple of, um, couple of other quick questions uh, that were also asked, but that are not solved yet. What is the derived subgroup of GT? So certainly GT, if you forget the F, you get lambda, you get Z hat star, and that's the abelianization of GQ. So 
you get the abelianization of GQ as a quotient of GT, but is it the abelianization of GT? We don't know. So this is something that has not been proved yet. Huh? There's one more slide, but it just has a, a final question. Just a final question. I have, yeah, I don't know, I'm actually done. Uh, piatic subgroups, are there piatic subgroups that correspond to the Frobenius? Well, these were actually very beautifully constructed by, um, by Yves André. And the last question, which has a long thing, but it doesn't matter. The question is, apart from the conjugates of complex conjugation, is there any torsion in GT, which there isn't any in TQ? And this is a crazy question because you think you know. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I keep forgetting. Uh, these are the questions. And that's, that's the question I ask. So the first question is, oh my gosh, you should have told me before. Uh, is this element self-centralizing? Okay, that's just what I was saying. Uh, the derived subgroup, we just don't know. Piatic subgroups, these were actually just, these were actually defined and they exactly correspond to the Frobenius subgroups. And the last question, is there any torsion in GT? This is just a funny question because you would think, you know, that either we could show there's no torsion or if there, are, if there were torsion, we could find it. But in fact, this is an answer. So those four questions that two have been solved since then and two of them have not. That's. Okay, uh, thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, are there any questions or comments? I should say that the, the genus zero group GT, which I mostly talk about here, was also uh, the subject of concentration for a long time before I went to higher genus. And it, Drinfeld and everybody worked in the genus zero case. Uh, it, it was really the original version of the Gossens of Teichmiller group. The genus zero, the genus G case happened at a later stage. I, I did not quite get the statement you made about M12. Did you say that there is a one more relation to M12 and we don't know? You, you can, it's, it's not a proven fact that the three relations of GT do not suffice. Does GT act on the pi one of M12? We don't know. I'm not going to say it doesn't, but we can't make it do it. We couldn't prove it. So, but if you add one more condition, just one more, then yes, not only do you get the action on M12, but on all of the all, all of the MGNs. I mean, I, I, you had shown that some kind of Pentagon relation is enough to do the hexagon it's relation, it's right? It's not, it's Does that has had anything to do? Oh, that? yeah. So that's yeah. another thing. Yeah. That oh, no. We have four relations now. One, two, three, and then the new one that I did write down. But we don't know if they imply each other. But in the pro-unipotent case, this is an amazing result that the, the Pentagon implies one and two. But we could not prove this in the pro case. And that's actually maybe one of the only results that we really have in the pro unipotent case and we don't have in the pro case. Because usually they're parallel what happens in the two situations. Three implies one. Yeah, yeah, it's, yes. Yeah, it's, a, but not three implies two. Actually, the first time I ever met Hide Kazu when you were maybe, I don't know, 19 or something, you told me three implies one. It was in 1999 and you were very young. And, and you said to me, three implies one. It trivially, and I was so surprised. Okay, and the other thing is, um, uh, yeah, this uh, result with outstar of gamma zero n, so it's a kind of analog of the result of Yara uh, in um, Israel Journal of Matches. 
uh, about GRT being uh, out there star of uh, PN, uh, which are SN invariant, yes? Yeah. In the algebra framework. Actually, maybe you know. Uh, has something been proved that you don't need to write out star anymore and that maybe all automorphisms? No, no, it's much stronger, but just uh, I, I'm discussing the basic result. So if you, uh, the, in Yara, he proves that you take out there star of this PN and then you take them to be SN invariant. Yeah. You're speaking now in the Lie algebra. In the algebra. Yeah. And then these Lie algebras are uh, connected with one another. This this really this Lie algebra results of Ihara, the stable derivation algebra. It. That it's derivations of, of four that, that extend to five. Yeah. And then it, yeah. this is exactly the analog of that. It, uh, but in the pro yeah. finite case. Yeah. Right. It's, it's yeah, because you put bracket n and this means invariance under s. It's exactly the analog of that result. Yeah. And in fact, I used very much to what happens in the Lie algebra also happens in Profinite that you yeah. have analogy. Yeah. And that's why this result, Pentagon implies this relation too. Yeah. Okay. It's just surprising to me that we, we don't at this point have the analogy there. Okay. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions or comments? Uh, so let's uh, thanks again to the, the speaker. <laughs>